it, it doesn't because I've been not speaking quickly. Um, I know, I see. Can you both have the back? Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay, dokie. Um, well, if you're ready, I'll get started. Okay. Resolved. Rights pre-exist and are not created or bestowed by government. Right away, we can see that this is a fact def and a fact resolution, so it's critical that we start out with a couple of definitions, both from Oxford English dictionaries. The first is a right. A right is defined as a moral or legal entitlement to have or do something. Grant is defined as to agree to give or allow something requested to. So right away, we can see a critical difference between a right and something that is granted. A right is something that is entitled to, something you deserve because of who you are or what group you belong to. Likewise, um, grant means that you have to be given that thing, that whoever is giving you said thing has permission, has, has a right or authority to give it to you. They, they own it, essentially. Now, I'm going to be giving a roadmap for my case today, and I'll be expounding with various other arguments and evidence as the round unfolds. My first main point is that government is unable to grant rights, by definition. Rights are fundamental expressions of our humanity. The freedom to do, to be, and to say are the things that make us humans in the first place. No one should ever have to ask government permission to be human. It's in our nature from the beginning of our existence. Moreover, rights precede government and they justify laws. Even in a state of nature or anarchy, human beings are born free and equal and thereby have rights by nature of who they are. And this concept has been expounded upon and agreed by some of the greatest and most influential philosophers of humankind, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, men who in their own right helped inspire some of the most prosperous and free republics in human history. Moreover, this is continually recognized today by organizations such as the UN in its Declaration of Human Rights. We can see that in political philosophy, laws are created for the protection of human rights, rights that are threatened in a state of anarchy, not the other way around. Thereby, they are transcendent, they precede government itself. Therefore, government could never grant it. My second main point is that government grants, anything that government grants, is not a privilege. It is a privilege, not a right. So if government has to grant it to you, it's not really a right at all. A very poignant example of this is North Korea. In North Korea, a right is seen as something that can be revoked if it's inconvenient to the collective or to the Communist Party. It's like a driver's license that you can have revoked or you know, you can have points put on it. And Okay, uh, sorry for the little bit delay. So, uh, all right, uh, one thing here. Uh, I believe that in order for Pro to claim victory in this debate, she must demonstrate that rights pre-exist government. In order to demonstrate that this idea is patently nonsensical, I'm going to be defending the following statement. Rights come into existence if and only if there is an agreement between a sufficiently high number of people and if at least some of those individuals are power enough to en powerful enough to enforce adherence to the agreement. To defend this statement, I'm going to use three lines of reasoning. I think my lines of reasoning will interact well with what she's mentioned so far, uh, though coming at it from a different direction. My first line of reasoning is that a human devoid of any other human interaction is devoid of rights. It makes absolutely no sense to consider a human being isolated e from other human beings and say that an individual has rights. They have rights for what? It just makes no sense that that individual would have rights. So from that, we know that rights uh, are the result of agreements between people and it's not necessarily true that there's a agreements will provide an equal amount of rights to all the people involved. Uh, this is demonstrated in our own history and, and is currently demonstrated throughout uh, throughout the world in different governments. Different governments uh, bestow uh, different amount of rights to different groups. Uh, these rights are not equal to each individual do not have equal rights. And uh, all those involved are in agreement or at least they're forced into agreement by those powerful enough. Finally, uh, my third argument 
is going to be that agreement between individuals that rights are bestowed. And this is more to uh, just to point out that rights aren't inherent or they're nothing intrinsic and they're changing all the time. Um, those involved in the agreement, uh, they change who are bestowed rights and they change which rights are bestowed. Uh, this is uh, demonstrated through, like I said, throughout our history, even currently more rights are being bestowed to individuals uh, that gain more power. We don't say that uh, women in America gain the privilege to vote. We say that they gain the right to vote. So uh, that changed as women gained more power and they were able to uh, insert a certain more influence. Uh, so rights change, who gets rights change. That is all indicative that rights are bestowed uh, by the government. Uh, pass it back to you. Thank you. So I want to start off by pointing out that the opposition has failed to really address the key factor of this round, the differentiation between rights and privileges. The whole idea of a right is that it's something that you're awarded by nature of who you are or what group you belong to. And according to the opposition, rights are something that you have to have permission for. Now he used a social contract style justification for this, but he didn't really give a warrant as to why that claim is true. He says that you need the permission of the collective in order to have a right, but he never gave a reason as to why this is true. The closest thing he came to, as far as giving a reason goes, is saying that if you're in isolation, you can't possibly have a right. Well, that's certainly not true because Thomas Hobbes, in writing about the state of nature in Leviathan, says that the state of nature is lonely, brutish, poor, violent. It's all those things, devoid of civil interaction from any other human beings. And yet, and yet, Hobbes says that we still have rights because rights are something that we have as an expression of our humanity. Now, Friedrich Bastier, in his work, The Law, wrote that life, liberty, property, the basic essential human rights, these are man, he said, this is man. So it's not something that you have to have given to you or you have to have a social consensus. You carry it with you, your freedom to do, to be, to say, and to believe. These are things that are fundamental expressions of your existence. If you exist as a human being, you have a right and you don't need anyone else's permission or consensus to have it. And that's the critical issue of this round right there. Whether or not you need consensus to be human, and I say no, no you don't. Now, in his third line of reasoning, the opposition said that women were granted the right to vote. And for a long time, as a, as a woman especially, I feel like this is a misnomer. Women did not gain the right to vote. We were not given the right to vote. We always had the right to vote. It just took a long time for men to come around and finally recognize things the way they were. Now, there's actually some conservative feminists who didn't like the Equal Rights Amendment because they believed that the 14th Amendment already covered basic human rights that women already had. It didn't need to be acknowledged. It was already there. Same line of reasoning. We as human beings don't need government's permission to have rights. Our rights can be protected, certainly. And Friedrich Bastier says that's the reason the law exists in the first place. But we don't need consensus. You and I, we are the source of our rights, whether or not we have consensus. To have rights is to be human, and we need no one else for that. Thank you, and I now pass the mic to my esteemed colleague. And... Okay, uh, just to touch on a few things. She said, I failed di to differentiate between rights and privilege. Uh, now, according to her own definition of rights, she said rights are a moral or legal entitlement to have or attain something or to act in a certain way. Now, I'm not sure um, how you would pull that out and say that you have an legal entitlement uh, without having laws and laws are the result of having government. So even if you have a moral law, you have a, uh, an authoritarian that dictates that moral law. So either way, you have government. So by the own definition that she provided, rights require government to, uh, to exist. But uh, let me go on to... Uh, see if I can further clarify what uh, what I'm trying to say here. Uh, she brought up, uh, she said that there are many people that believe that he, human beings are our rights. Now, I'm not sure exactly what argument can be made for that. Uh, 
as a human being, I have the ability uh, to declare myself king. I can say that I'm king, but what right do I have to rule over anyone? Uh, I don't have any right like that. The only right comes strictly from my power or those who agree to follow me. And if I have none, then whatever I do to myself or whatever I do, that is, uh, that's not a right that I have. I can only grant myself rights that people agree to give me, I guess. So rights only exist, as she was saying, rights only exist if they're agreed upon between individuals. So if individuals uh, don't agree on them, then we don't have, we, we don't have rights. Um, let me go back to her argument on using the right to vote, saying that she, women always had the right to vote. This uh, goes on to the point. She said that women always had the right to vote. It just took a while for people to recognize that they had, that they had that right to vote. I don't know what what it would mean to vote without people recognizing. So it'd be like saying, I'm going to stand in the street and yell my opinion, but, and that opinion has value in change, it has value or actual potential to change the course of an election, but that's just not true. You don't have the value just because you wish it, just because you wish to have a right doesn't mean that you have one. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. So one of the first points that my opponent made in response to my arguments is that I defined a right in part as being a legal obligation, but it doesn't mean what he described it as meaning. A legal obligation is something the government owes you, not something that the government gives you. And to illustrate this point, I'd like to read an excerpt from one of my favorite books. I've cited it already several times, Friedrich Bastier's The Law. In the law, Friedrich Bastier says, it is not because men have made laws that personality, liberty, property exists. On the contrary, it is because personality, liberty, property exist beforehand that men made laws. So when I say that rights are a legal obligation, I am not saying that they are created by government, but rather government exists to meet the needs of the people, the people who have rights. Now, my opponent also tried to deconstruct my argument that human beings are fundamentally entitled to their rights because our rights are a fundamental expression of who we are. He said that he could declare himself king, but what would give him the right to be king? Well, if you go back to my original arguments, my constructive, you'll see I never made any such claim. He has the freedom to speak and say he's gay. That's inherent to who he is, but no one can change reality. No one has the right to change reality because no one has the ability to arbitrarily change reality and make themselves king. So while he has a fundamental human right of speech, it, it's a misnomer to say that I think people can change reality fundamentally. The truth remains that as human beings, an expression of who we are to do, to be, and to say within the context of reality, that is something that is a fundamental part of the human experience. And remember what I said, remember what Bastier said, the government functions to protect this essential facet of humanity. So without it, our rights, things that we deserve because of who we are as humans are basically like driver's licenses. So earlier, my opponent also said that what is the right to vote worth without people recognizing it? Well, here's what it's worth. Susan B. Anthony marched into a polling place and voted even though the men in her area thought she didn't have the right to, but she knew that she did because she knew that women were citizens and that citizens were human. And because of that, she had a right to equal suffrage. Susan B. Anthony recognized the fundamental truth that her rights were something that no government could take away, whether or not there was a consensus. She didn't need any man's consensus. She didn't need any man's permission. She was a human and she had that right. And because I believe that, I urge you to follow the same reasoning, to recognize that fundamental expression of what it means to be a human. So with that, I'll pass the mic to my opponent. Okay, uh, she began this round of the rebuttal by saying the government owes you rights, okay? To me, this is difficult to understand. Uh, governments are composed of individuals, individuals who have an agreement. So, so then you're saying that when you say government, you're saying that every other individual owes you the rights. Well. 
we know that that isn't the case. Uh, we know that individuals do not owe other people anything. We know that they are granted and agreed upon through, as she mentioned, the social contract, that in a particular situation, people act in a certain way. Governments don't exist to meet the needs of the people. People create governments in order to enforce their own agreements as to what the state of the, the world should be. People agree that things should be a certain way. If enough of people agree, they form a government. If people agree that certain that certain groups of individuals should be allowed to do certain things and people are powerful enough to force everybody into line, then they create a government. Governments do not exist to meet the needs of people. People exist. People create governments in order to enforce their agreements. Uh, she said that uh, in my uh, rebuttal, I was not talking about a freedom to, to declare myself king. What I was actually speaking of is uh, freedom of speech. She's right. So human beings have the ability to speak. Now, do we have a right to speak? There are many situations, uh, even in our own government, where people do not have the right to speak. They are, they are, we protect freedom of speech in certain situations, but then there are also certain situations when we do not protect the freedom of speech. So if you can take and be justified into removing a right, then that right is not inherent. It is defined by the government. So in instances when you're allowed to speak, in instances when you're not to speak, if they're defined based on the agreement that people say, oh, in these certain instances, we agree and we'll enforce other people to agree that we can speak in certain instances, we can speak in, we cannot speak in other instances. That is a right that sh clearly shows uh, is given and bestowed by the government. So again, she wanted, she made the point again that no government could take away the rights. Uh, so in, uh, she's, I, th I think, uh, Rosa Parks, no one sh could take away her rights. Well, obviously the government had taken away her rights. The government had taken it away through the entire history of the United States up until the point that it decided to bestow those rights. So to say that they can't take them away, I mean, I just, I mean, that's demonstrably false. The rights were taken away. They were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to participate in the way. So that's just. So I'm going to be going over really quickly some misconceptions that my opponent has brought forward. And then I'm going to be just summing up a couple of issues that I feel going forward are going to be very influential in the round. My opponent's arguments, I'm just going to group them under one big problem. And that is he believes that government or consensus creates your rights. And that without that consensus, you don't have those rights. He mentioned the social contract, as did I. And I think it's high time that we expanded upon this the way it deserves to be. The social contract was created by John Locke, John, 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 John Rousseau, and Thomas Hobbes. These Enlightenment philosophers believed, as did Bossier, that government was created to protect human rights. So if my opponents were going to be using the social contract theory, it's notable to mention that none of the philosophers who came up with the theory that he is espousing actually believe in his position whatsoever. Locke, Bossier, Rousseau, they believed that our rights are a part of our humanity, even in a state of nature, even in a state of anarchy. The fact of the matter is Rosa Parks, Susan B. Anthony didn't need permission from any man, any white man, any person, any consensus to have their rights. We do human rights advocacy as human beings because we believe that human rights were violated, not that they were taken away. Because if government can take away rights, then why do we care? Why do we care that they're doing forced abortions in China? Why did we care that in 1994, there was a Rwandan genocide? We care because it doesn't matter if the government doesn't recognize a person's rights. They still have them. They can't be taken away. They are a fundamental expression of our humanity. And I provided evidence to show why this is true. The fact of the matter is that we can't work under a tenable civilized society believing that our rights, our humanity, is somehow an inconvenience to government. My opponent has said that we come together to create a social contract, but he has been avoiding the issue. Why does government come together to create a social contract? Why do we have social contracts? I've answered that question. We have social contracts to protect rights. 
So here are the issues that we should be looking at for going forward. One, what is the purpose of a social contract? Two, why do we care about human rights advocacy at all if human rights can be taken away justly by government? And third, do we really have to ask permission to government to be humans, to be who we are? I don't think so. I don't think we ever do. And because I think that we share that in common, that belief in our humanity, again, I urge you to join me and vote for the resolution. I'll be passing the mic again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, she is absolutely right when I when she says that I believe that government creates rights. Uh, I don't know what it means when she keeps conflating uh, human rights with what it means to be human. We wouldn't say that other animals have rights. Uh, we say, I mean, we don't say that monkeys have rights. We don't say that dogs have rights. We don't say that ha rats have rights. As human beings, we are not su sufficiently different in our anatomy to say that we have some little special organ that has our rights there. So just to being human does not mean that we have rights. I mean, to say that we have a right to be human is just to saying that we are that we are human and we can uh, we can talk about that or not as you know i mean clearly to me it seems that a uh, human being human and having rights is not the same thing she talked about a uh, social contract theory that governments are created to protect human rights what she failed to mention is that when a government uh comes together to cr create and protect human rights who defines those human rights is there a, a universal set of human rights no the government itself says these are the human rights that we define that are important. They apply to these people and we're going to ensure because we're sufficiently powerful enough that these people get those get those rights and have protection of those rights. So there are no, there's no list that people pull from. Every government is different. Every government believes that human the human rights of individuals are different. We see this all over the world where different governments think value different things. As she mentioned several different examples that uh, because she's looking at it from a uh, westernized worldview, she thinks that, oh, this is there a violation of human rights? Well, no, they just believe in a different set of human rights. Governments have defined different human rights. And so we're looking at it from our point of view and from our from the from the view of our agreement that we have come to, that we have fighting for, that we've run up and say, oh, they're over there. They're backwards. They're doing it. Uh, they're violating their human rights. Well, no, they just defined the rights in that in that government differently. So uh, you want, she wants to know why do we care? Well, we care because we've grown up. We believe things are a certain way, and we think that our way is the best way. Everyone else thinks that their way is the best way. We've all come to agreement with those around us to say this is what our human rights are. We're going to protect those, and we're going to try to put those onto other people. But Again, there are different governments who have different human rights. Just the fact that that is true and not every government values the same human rights should demonstrate that human rights are not something innate or not something that are easily found. They are something that instead are defined by individuals. Those individuals happen to get together in an agreement and create their government to defend what they believe to be their human rights. So I want to get down to the basic voting issues of this round, but first I want to address two new arguments that my opponent brought up very late in the round, but I will choose to address them nonetheless. The first is he said, why should humans have rights? How are we more special than any other animal? And honestly, the most broad, appealing, logical answer is metacognizance. We're aware that we're thinking. We are the highest, most elevated form of animal there is and ever will be. And I could go on but I think that that's basically the best answer anyone could ever give. As far as a broad based appeal, you don't have to believe in God to know that humans are special. So he also said that human rights are relative according to whatever government you want. He actually said that we shouldn't look at other governments as backwards for their human rights violation. So think about what he just said. He just said that China's practice of forced abortions is something that we should just take lying down and we should accept the hardships and the sufferings. The fact of the matter is equal and all people are born free and forcing a woman to undergo an abortion without her consent is one of the most heinous things a person could ever do. And we know that because human beings do not have the right to violate another person's choice to take away a woman's pregnancy when she wants her child. 
truth is not relative. And this type of relativism that my opponent is espousing harms the education of the realm. Because if we're just going to say that however people want to do things is their truth, then why debate? I believe that debate has meaning, that we're here to find truth today. I believe that humanity is important and special and that truth matters and there is a right and there is a wrong. And if people don't believe that there's a right and there's a wrong, why debate at all? I think we're here to find truth. So here's what I believe are the voting issues for this draft. Honest and simple. First, why do we have a social contract? My opponent cannot answer. And he never addressed the fact that every social contract philosopher, every philosopher who invented the idea he's trying to espouse does not agree with him. The fact of the matter is you cannot espouse an ideology and then have every person who would support you disagree with you. It's academically untenable. The second point that we need to remember as a voting issue is why does anyone need permission from the government to, for their basic expression of humanity? Your ability to believe in God or not believe in God, your ability to speak your mind, your ability to live your life so long as it does not harm others, that is what makes you human. Otherwise, you'd just be a vegetable. So the fact of the matter remains, we have a social contract to protect the fundamental expressions of our humanity, the reasons we're alive, what makes us unique. And because I believe in that, and because I hope that you believe in that, I urge you to join me. Okay, uh, so in the closing three minutes, I guess, uh, I just want to point out that my opponent's evaluation of the human race as being special because we have metacognition is uh, as human centric as her worldview is westernized. She believes that because we live in this certain uh, society that she feels is really great, that then all of other societies are wrong and that we can point out at other societies and say that, oh, they're violating my my those individuals' human rights. Well, the reason she thinks that is because in our Western world, we have defined human rights in a very specific way. Now, that goes on to my point to saying that we define our human rights. We define as a as a people, as an agreement, and then through our agreement as a government, what is our human rights are. So those are, are defining. She argues then that uh, every political philosopher, she says, doesn't agree with what I'm I'm saying. I you know, she's obviously well versed in in, uh, in the philosophy, but it seems to me that philosophers recognize that they define human rights because they they define what what human rights are. That's why they disagree on which rights that humans that humans have. So I'm just going to come back um, and just go over my argument why you should vote why you should vote con here. Uh, I believe I have demonstrated that rights are not innate because by pointing out that individual human beings isolated from humanity it's nonsensical to think that they have rights at all what it was even mean that if i'm the only human alive that i have the right to do anything or i have the right to speak or the right as she says to be human so second uh, she used the uh, social contract theory we have a social contract is 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 an idea that for our society to progress, we have to come in agreement that uh, if you're going to be a part of the society, you have to act in a certain way. To act in a certain way is to recognize that certain individuals have certain rights to do things. Now, every society is different. Every society believes that certain individuals can do certain can do different things. Those are defined by the government, by the contract itself. I mean, this is non-controversial. I mean, we've made an argument of it, but to me, it seems like a pretty straightforward idea. So um, if we, as a group of individuals, come to an agreement and we define what we believe should be our human rights, and then we try to force people to adhere to them, then clearly government bestows rights. Is accused of being Western-centric, you'll see it's charged. All right, I won't, uh, I won't go further since I worked out that I had an extra 30, 30 seconds. Again, thank you. It's been wonderful. I uh, hope it didn't come across too, too forceful. Remember, I wrote this uh, thinking I was going to be debating your husband. So I was going to be, 
I'm, I'm more usually more polite than that. So anyway, uh, even though I think you're completely wrong, it was a fun debate. All right. <laughs> Take care.